All right, we're up to chapter seven of White Monster. Um, our boys are heading out. It's early in the morning and they are leaving their car behind and heading out into the wilderness. Um, as I read today, just hold on to those big details in your mind, the big events that happen. And at the end, you will summarize chapter seven. It was easier finding the road this time because the wind from the day before had blown the snow off here and there. But half an hour, but after half an hour, Lee asked, how come we're climbing uphill all the time? When we drove up here, it seemed like it was all uphill. And now we're going down and it's still uphill. Uh, it goes up and down, Jordan said. There are little rises and falls. That's the way mountains are. Seems to me like it's going a lot more uphill than down, Lee added, panting. I've got to stop and catch my breath. Okay, but not for long, Jordan said. He was panting too. We're probably still not very strong, he thought. Jordan looked upwards. The clouds were building again. They hovered low and threatening above them. The blue patches of sky and the sun were all but gone. Lee looked around at the towering fir trees wrapped in snow. This doesn't look right, Jordan, he said. It doesn't look like the way we came in. I don't remember all the trees being this thick or this tall. Ah, uh, you just weren't paying attention, Jordan assured him, glancing at the sky. We better get moving again. Another half an hour later, Lee stopped panting even more than before. Are you sure we're going in the right direction, man? Are you crazy? Jordan snapped. Of course we're going in the right direction. We're going south, down the mountain. But Lee had introduced an element of doubt into his mind. It didn't seem as if the roads were getting steeper. And maybe he wasn't just out of breath because of weakness. Maybe his lungs were telling him that he and Lee were going to higher elevations. He glanced around then. The trees did look taller. Even the snowdrifts looked more formidable. Fear clawed at his insides. What if they were going deeper into the mountains instead of getting closer to the warmer lowlands? Clouds covered the sky now, and while there was a brightness here and there behind them, he couldn't really see where the sun was. How do you tell which direction you're headed if there's no sun to go by, he wondered. He seemed to remember one of his teachers covering that at one point, but of course, he'd pay no attention. Lee shook his head. I think we're going in the wrong direction, Jordan, he said. Jordan did not want to hear that. They had already walked for more than an hour. If they were going in the wrong direction, they had wasted a precious hour of daylight, and they would need to spend another hour just getting back to where they had started. In his mind, Jordan raged against his own ignorance. Why don't I know how to tell directions? He asked himself in disgust. Animals and fish know where they're going. Every year, birds fly from Alaska to South America and don't get lost. Even a butterfly knows how to set. Even a butterfly knows how to head south. Why don't I? My fourth grade teacher once told us how to find directions with a wrist wristwatch and a stick. Lee said, "Really." Jordan sneered. Then why don't you check it? Be why didn't you check it before we started? Lee shrugged. I don't know. You just seemed so sure. Well, don't just stand there, Jordan explained. Do the stupid thing with your watch. Lee crouched on the ground, finding a smooth rock. He brushed off the snow, and then he lay his watch face up on the rock. Is this for real? Jordan asked doubtfully. Miss Quigley said it is, Lee said, glancing up. I hope there's enough sun to do this. He found a small, straight twig and leaned it carefully against the watch so that the hour hand and the weak shadow cast by the twig lined up. Halfway between the shadow and 12 o'clock was south. He looked up, his face grim. We're going in the wrong direction, Jordan, he said. I don't believe it, Jordan fumed. It's an old wives' tale or something. It doesn't mean anything. It's true, Lee said flatly. Jordan fumed for a minute. How could Lee know more about this than he did? He wondered. Finally, he said, okay, we'll have it your way. We'll walk back the way we came. But if you're wrong and we're wasting all that time, I'll swear I'll strangle you. They retraced their steps then, and now the terrain seemed generally downhill. Jordan began to suspect that Lee was right. He couldn't imagine how Lee had been clever enough to sense their deadly mistake, and he, 
Jordan hadn't had a clue. It embarrassed and angered him to think about it. Could Lee be smarter than he and everyone gave him credit for? They passed the disabled car that they had left earlier and kept walking. We're going south, all right, Lee said. We wasted two hours, Jordan said bitterly. Too bad you didn't do your watch trick right away. I'm sorry, Jordan, Lee said. Jordan said, noticed that Lee said nothing about Jordan leading them in the wrong direction in the first place. Jordan wondered if he, himself, would have been so generous in the same situation. At least you found the mistake out before we got really deep into the mountains, Jordan added guiltily, but Lee did not reply. As the boys struggled along, the, ground, the clouds grew even thicker. The wind was picking up, growing colder, more biting. Jordan realized with dread that the skies of that morning had simply been a break in the weather. Another storm was coming. But now they had left the car far behind. If a storm caught them in the open without shelter, they were doomed. They would never survive the night. It's getting colder, Lee said. I know, Jordan mumbled, not wanting to admit it. So what if it starts snowing, Lee asked. What do we do? Jordan knew that Lee still believed in his ability to save them, even though it had been Lee who had figured out the right direction. Lee looked to Jordan as a little boy who would to an older brother or a father. Keep your eye out for anything that looks like shelter, a cave, a rocky crevice, anything, Jordan said. The minute we see it, we'll head over there. Suddenly, getting down the mountain became less important to Jordan than finding a shelter. The clouds darkened overhead, and he could almost feel the storm beginning to roar. The monster is waking up again, he thought grimly. Over there, Jordan said, pointing across a clearing to a base of a cliff. Is that an opening in the rock? Yeah, it looks like a small cave. An awfully small cave, Lee said. Doesn't matter. Come on, Jordan ordered, leading the way. The snow was nearly two feet deep across the clearing. The two boys struggled their way through in a frantic rush to get to the cave. Flakes were already flying when they reached the cave. They trudged a couple of large, dead branches out of the snow and piled them against the opening. Then they crawled into the small space and huddled together. You think some animals live in here? Lee asked when they were inside. Maybe, Jordan said, surveying their new lodgings. As awful as the car was, the cave was even worse. It was damp and dirty, and there was nothing to sit on but the cold floor. How long do you think we'll be here? Lee asked. How should I know? Jordan replied. Lee was looking around, too. Now, he said softly, I wish, I kind of wish we were still in the car. You're crazy, Jordan said. You think some accommodating weasel was going to drop by with a dead grouse every day? Eventually, we would have starved. But what if we're trapped here for days? Lee groaned. If we are, we are, Jordan said, already growing tired of Lee's questions. I don't like the idea any better than you do, but maybe it'll keep us from freezing to death. Maybe, Lee said. Then again, maybe the animal that lives here will come back and eat us. Yeah, probably a big grouse paying us back for eating his buddy, Jordan sneered. Lee was really getting on his nerves. Just be quiet, will you? Why don't you shut up? Lee snapped. Jordan was so surprised, he did shut up. He had no idea what to say. Lee had never been rude to him before. Jordan had been to rude to Lee many times, but Lee had never seemed to mind. He seemed to accept it as a price he had to pay for having someone like Jordan as a friend. But Lee had never demanded such payment of Jordan. Sorry, Jordan, Lee said almost immediately. I didn't mean it. It's just that I'm so tired of all this and... I know, Jordan said in a softer voice. This is hard on both of us. Let's just try to get through it without biting each other's heads off, okay? Okay, Lee said. Hey, that kind of reminds me of the Donner Party. <laughs> Very funny, Jordan laughed. To the boy's surprise, it snowed less than 45 minutes before blue reappeared in the sky. This time, the clouds began to move out quickly as sun reappeared, and for once, there was more blue sky than gray. Jordan breathed a sigh of relief. The brief snowfall had been the monster's last gasp. The storm was over for good. Let's go, Jordan said. 
pushing the tree branches out of the way. We've only got a few hours of daylight left, and we've got a long way to go. The boys took to the road again. Sometimes it was easy to see the bare pavement, but in one more open area, snow had drifted across the road, often hiding it for a quarter of a mile at a time. Then the boys had to walk where they thought the road was. They usually did pretty well, ending up just a few feet off the concrete when it reappeared, but once they were off by more than a hundred feet. Man, how did we get way over here? Lee asked, scratching his head. I don't know, but let's get back on the road, Jordan replied. If this experience had taught him anything, it was how easy it was to get lost in these mountains. By mid-afternoon, Jordan spotted something in the distance. Hey, Lee, what's that ahead? Jordan asked. It looks like a big green snow drift, Lee replied. Exactly, Jordan said, and there's no such thing. My guess is it's a dome tent, the kind people use for camping in the mountains. You think so? Lee cried excitedly. I do. Jordan began to run. I can't believe it. Someone's camping down there. We're saved, Lee. We're saved. They ran, stumbling, falling, and getting up again until they reached the tent. But as they approached, Jordan could see a long tear in one side of the tent. The two boys glanced around the campsite. There were no footprints in the snow and no remains of a campfire. The only sign of human life was the blue tarp that had been that had been suspended on four poles, evidently for sitting under. But the wind had done its work on the tarp too. It was now hanging limply from only one pole and moving slightly in the breeze. It's abandoned, Jordan said, his heart sinking. But why would anyone just leave a tent behind? Yeah, it doesn't make sense, Lee said. I'll check out the tent, Jordan said. Maybe there's something in it we can use. Jordan went to the front of the tent. The zippered flap was partially open, and in the dark green dimness, he could see piles of snow that had blown in from the last blizzard. He also saw a large sleeping bag in one corner of the tent. His heart raced. A nice, warm, fleece-lined sleeping bag. It looked big enough for both boys. Tonight, they would be warm. And at the foot of the sleeping bags was a small chest and a box of what looked like camping utensils. With any luck, they would be warm and full. Jordan unzipped the rest of the flap, bent down, and started to enter the tent. Suddenly, he sucked in his breath. In the dimness of the tent, he had not noticed that someone was sticking out from under the piles of snow on one side of the tent. Legs? Jordan looked closer. A man was lying flit face down on the floor of the tent. Snow covered most of his body. Either the cold temperatures had preserved him, or he had not been dead very long. That is the end of chapter seven. Head into Canvas, summarize what you read today, and tune back in later for chapter eight.